Thank you very, very much, everybody, for being here this afternoon. And before I go any further, I want to thank uh, Congressman Mike Doyle and Congressman Jason Altmaier, our representatives in Congress, for uh, sponsoring this event and arranging us to, for us to be uh, uh, in this room. Uh, let me explain the apple. It's to be eaten. They're clean. They're, they're, they haven't been doctored in any way. But of course, they're there to uh, make a statement. Uh, this is all about education. It's all about teaching and about teachers. The focus is going to be on technology and the role that technology can play in higher education and a particular technology that we've developed at Carnegie Mellon. But it is not to replace teachers. Teachers are still very much a part of this. And the apple is there to remind all of us of that. But much away. We know uh, what your busy schedules are like. You probably didn't eat lunch either. We understand that we have some urgent problems. Problems related to cost. They are high and they're rising quickly. And that leads to exclusion, or if not exclusion, then crushing debt that many graduates have when they graduate. The other issue is there are simply too many students dropping out of the higher education system. Not enough achieving graduation, whatever that might be, in the program that they're in. There are just too many students not succeeding. So it's a two-edged problem, and in some respects, they're linked. President Obama called to the White House in December a group of university presidents, another of whom is here today, and I'll introduce uh, momentar par <coughs> excuse me, momentarily. Uh, and it was a very interesting session one in which the president conveyed to us his deep concern about these issues I just mentioned. In fact, he said to us in opening the session, you have no idea how many calls, letters, emails we get in the White House every day from families angry and concerned about this issue. He challenged us to think about new ways of approaching education. He's looking for a productivity revolution in higher education. He wants us to think outside of the box. And these are challenges we in higher education have to accept. I was there because I'm president of Carnegie Mellon University. And Carnegie Mellon has been a leader in developing technology for education that we think can be an important part of the response to this urgent problem that we face. The key to our approach is what we call learning science. This, in effect, is a new field that's come out of many decades of research at Carnegie Mellon and elsewhere that brings together cognitive psychology with computer science. It's a very powerful combination and one that we think can help to transform higher education. On the back of the program is a timeline that shows you the origins of this, how it developed over the years. Uh, to the point that we're at today. Let me acknowledge the support of many uh, sponsors, but in particular, and most recently, the National Science Foundation, which has been a key supporter of ours and is significantly the supporter of the Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center. I said it's time for a productivity revolution. Actually, the president said it's time for a productivity revolution, and I'm just mimicking his words. Uh, this is, in, in some respect, it's time for higher education as a sector to think of itself no different from other sectors that have seen great gains in productivity. There are some good reasons why productivity gains are hard in higher education. I won't bore you with the economic argument about that. But it's time for us to eat our own cooking, if I can put it that way. Uh, and we have developed uh, techniques and tools, and you're about to hear about one of them. Technology can be a vehicle to attack this problem, but I want to emphasize it's not the answer in and of itself. The key to the power of the open learning initiative that we're going to be telling you about is its grounding in very solid scientific principles about how children learn, about how people learn. Learning is a cognitive process and bringing together the insights from that cognitive science with computer science. That's the key. 
It's also the case that by adopting these kinds of methods, we, we then have um, basically real-time data at the finest grain about how students are learning in, in real time. We also have data that we can use to improve the basic science, the learning science that undergirds these technologies. This, this is a new idea and one that we've never had before. But simply put, and I'm gonna get off the stage, the one message I wanna convey is it works. What we're about to show you works. In our own case, we've been using our own students as guinea pigs, if I can put it that way. We have an, an OLI version of uh, introductory statistics. We had students who took it that way and students who took it the traditional way. The students who took it in the uh, uh, technology-based version, the OLI version, learned as well or better than the students in the traditional mode, but they learned it in half the time. So better and faster are pretty powerful things, and we, it's time for us to exploit them. This, when adopted, fundamentally changes the role of the faculty member. It doesn't get rid of the faculty member, remember the apple, but it changes the role that the faculty member plays. In fact, it makes the faculty member, we think, even more effective. And I will tell you that in engaging with faculty as we have, not only at our institution, but at large public university systems and community colleges, when the faculty understand what this is about, uh, they understand its power, they get very excited about it because they see it as a way to improve their teaching. And believe it or not, that's what faculty really want to do. They want to be the best teachers that they can be. Well, don't take it from me, take it from the experts, uh, the students themselves who've been exposed to it. The video you're about to see comes from Santa Ana Community College. It was shot by a teacher. We had nothing to do with this. We didn't commission it. The teacher who was using it in an introductory statistics course, sorry, using the OLI technology, decided to get out a video camera and uh, record her students and their reactions to using this technology and on her own initiative sent it to us. Of course, we're happy to receive it and you'll see why. I've taken the course once before and I did it through textbook and I have to say that this time around doing it through OLI is completely different. I feel like I'm learning everything for the first time. I, um, I guess I didn't have a complete understanding of statistics through the textbook but what I really really like about it is the feedback that you receive whether it's correct it tells you why you're correct and if you're incorrect, it's, it's read and tells you why you're incorrect, and it helps you out to answer correctly the second time. All right, the examples in a textbook and compared to the examples in LOI is pretty much the same, except that you're actually able to do it just right then and there and get the feedback. So it's, in a way, much more effective to learn, to know what you're doing. And probably the next best part about it is... Uh, you're actually able to do like math programs, like a mini tab in our case, to do the pro to do the problems, and it tells us how to do it step by step, as opposed to on a, on a book. You're kind of left short on that. So what I like about the examples is, um, like in a regular textbook, they'll um, they'll tell you what it is you need to learn, like they'll give you a formula or something, um, and then they'll try to incorporate it into an example. Um, but what OLI does, it, it kind of gives you the example first, um, and it builds on um, what you already know. I feel like it makes me um, really understand the material better because I'm going outside of just learning, you know, and memorizing. The thing with OLI, it gives the student autonomy to decide how much help they require. So it's not as a textbook in which it talks down to you. You feel like you're overwhelmed with all this information, but at the same time, it's almost like you have an instructor by your side to kind of nudge you on. Just, uh, I want to emphasize one thing. As you could infer from this, uh, OLI uh, refers to a learning environment. These are whole courses, statistics in this case, the one I also talked about, but not just statistics, where you, students can learn the material in an interactive way. It's not just taking course material and putting it up on the web. 
which many other universities have done, and that's a great thing. We, we applaud that. But students need more than just access to online material. They need a learning environment, an interactive environment. That's what OLI is. Now, to continue our program, I'm very pleased that we have with us today the Undersecretary of, uh, of uh, uh, Education, uh, Martha Cantor, with responsibilities for uh, higher education within the department. Uh, before coming to Washington, she served um, as chancellor of uh, Foothill De Anza Community College in California. A longtime friend and a great supporter of higher education. Thank you for being with us, Martha. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Cohen, and I'm so pleased to be in the company of scholars here at the cap at, 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 in the uh, House of Representatives because we are talking about education. And when you saw the students in that video, I think what all of our members of Congress and all of us in the Department of Education and every teacher in the classroom wants is students that are going to succeed and lead this next generation. So I'm really thrilled to be part of this conversation about the intersection of the learning sciences and technology and how that intersection, which is brand new for us, you know, gosh, I was thinking back, you know, the internet age happened and here we are with learning sciences and technology to improve instruction and figure out how we can get more students across the finish line. Uh, for us in the Department of Education, and I think for all of us as Americans, uh, a generation ago, we were first in the world in the number of students who were attaining a minimum of a baccalaureate level uh, degree and beyond. And today we're 16th. We're tied for 16th with three other countries, if you look at OECD uh, education at a glance. So we have a huge challenge before us, and Dr. Cohen mentioned uh, how these kinds of technologies and the learning sciences can help us really attack some of the challenges that we're facing. And in thinking about my few minutes of remarks, I pulled out two, and it was amazing that we sort of synchronized here, um, two of which what, you know, affect what happens in pretty much every classroom across America, whether it's American higher education, K-12 or even in our early learning classrooms. Uh, we have too many students that are underprepared. That's sort of a significant national challenge for us. When we have, and I'll just give three little statistics off the top of my head, a third of children are not ready for kindergarten. We have only 75% of students graduating from high school and in some communities around the country uh, way beyond that number, unfortunately. And then when we look at higher education, when you look across all of our institutions, and we have islands of excellence everywhere, and you're, you're hearing from a couple of them at Maryland and, and Carnegie Mellon, very high graduation rates, low default rates, all the kinds of things you wanna see that help students know that this is a place that I'm going to succeed in. Uh, what, what we look at is half of the students not finishing within six years with a minimum of an undergraduate degree. So, you know, when I think about going forward and I look at how can we address these kinds of pressing problems of under-preparation, that every teacher like myself, when I started out, you know, it was those students you couldn't reach and why, and is there a different way of redesigning what you're doing to reach them and get them on track and get them knowing that even if it's hard, I'm gonna do it anyway, and even if I fail the first time, I'm gonna be helped to learn how to do it the second or the third or the fourth time. I think what you're seeing here in this video is a way to experiment with how to do a whole lot better uh, as a society than we've done, certainly in my 40 years in education, uh, where we've, we've had these declines. Now the second challenge is about finishing what we start. And you know, you talked about the dropout rate, and that was the second challenge. It's taking too long to graduate. And whether you consider kindergarten readiness uh, being a graduation from a zero to six year old kid who's ready for first grade, or whether you think about high school graduation or college graduation, you know, we're losing too many students across that trajectory. And with the cost escalation, we've got to look for methods that are going to reduce cost keep increasing quality 
and deliver results for students and families. So when people say, you know, is college worth it? Should I just go for a training program? I say, you know, we, when, when Arne Duncan talks about this, he talks about college and career. We want students to have a vision for both in their life, and they may go into a training program right out of high school if they do graduate with the challenges that I mentioned, and that may be great, but you know, if they're gonna populate the kind of economy we're gonna need in this country, they're gonna have to continue on. So I always say college and career, it's not to say that everyone should get a baccalaureate degree or advanced degree, but if this nation is gonna be competitive in a global economy, we've got to do something to help more students get through. So the getting through part is what I love when I look at OLI and a lot of the course redesign work that, uh, that Chancellor Kerwin has done at the University of Maryland. You know, it's all about how do we keep students engaged in the content get that knowledge transferred in the best possible way, give faculty the kind of opportunity to do their best and learn with us in these new technological environments and learn about the learning sciences. We're, we're learning organizations in higher education. I mean, we're never gonna stop learning. But the bottom line is, are my students gonna acquire that content? Are they gonna be ready for the next level of course? And are they gonna stay on track to finish? And that's a big challenge for us going forward. So I think you know, when you see the, the, the data, the research, the evidence to say students are finishing in a shorter amount of time, if we could get students, at least 25%, hopefully 50% more students finishing their degrees in less time, we will actually be providing more into the economic base of this country. We're gonna be populating the two to three million jobs in the, in the economy that are unfilled today. We're going to sort of stop the tide of the declining role uh, that students are playing in the economy because they're not prepared for the jobs of the future. So I'm really inspired by the Open Learning Initiative. I think it's tremendously important. Uh, Secretary Duncan and certainly President Obama you know, talked about open learning early on. I, I pulled out some statistics. Um, that the first time the president talked about this, uh, when he talked right after office, he, I went with him uh, to Macomb Community College in, uh, in Michigan, and he talked about an online resource center and what would it look like for the nation. And it, it was proposed as a vision. What actually happened was Congress appropriated $2 billion. $500 million of that was announced last Friday by Vice President Biden. And that's an opportunity to do this kind of thing, apply these technologies in the learning sciences to the academy, to the academic programs, whether it's a community college or a university. What we want to see is much more collaboration across the higher education sectors so that they can take advantage of these new ways that students can learn and be much more successful than they have in the past. So today, you know, the president proposed in the last couple of weeks since the State of the Union a couple of ideas that we hope to see going forward. One is called a race to the top for higher education, focused on college affordability and quality and completion. So we are reaching out to higher education and policymakers to say, what would this look like to incentivize these kinds of environments to increase student success? And what can we do in a shared responsibility environment so that states can play their part, public institutions can thrive, private institutions can lead the way, and we can work together so that institutions can really get those graduation goals uh, far more accelerated than we have in this last generation. And we think that also, you know, a fund which the president has called first in the world, he did say that he would like to get America back to be first in the world in the number, uh, in the proportion of college graduates uh, across our nation when compared to other countries. So proposing a first in the world competition would give professors that you'll hear from today and others around the country the chance to really innovate and take this kind of work and double and triple the results going forward. That's what we want to see. We have too many students that are underprepared at too many levels. So it's very exciting work in my opinion. We've got a couple of proposals that I think can be really helpful to us going forward. And you know, as educators, let me just close off by saying, you know, every having been a teacher for many, many years, you know, every student learns differently. And every student has different needs and different capacities, and I call them assets. You know, some students uh, don't have the kind of confidence we want to see in our student population. And what works for one student may hold another student back. And I think that's the beauty of what the learning sciences can offer, is that differentiation so that students can follow 
the learning environment and take advantage of different ways of accessing the knowledge so that they can really do their best and use all of their talents and skills in this regard. So I want to thank you, Dr. Cohen, for inviting me to get up here and just give you a few words from our perspective. We're very supportive of this kind of environment. We think open lear the Open Learning initi Initiative is leading the way. We think that a lot of this is stimulating, and I know this firsthand. I just came back from Ohio, and I've been to uh, a couple of other uh, places. I think we have Rosemary Nassif, who just met with, I think, over 100 colleges uh, the other day. A lot, it's stimulating a lot of thinking about how are we going to redesign the curriculum for the 21st century so that we can significantly increase, on the one hand, the preparation of students, and on the other hand, the acceleration so that they can be successful and move on into the workforce and into society to make their contributions like we have done in our time. So thank you very much and look forward to hearing uh, Dr. Kerwin. Thank you very much, Martha. Uh, another uh, president who was at the White House at that meeting I referred to before was Brett Kerwin, the chancellor of the University of Maryland system. He's a longtime leader in the uh, world of uh, public higher education. Uh, the University of Maryland system is probably uh, doing the best of any public university system right now uh, in what is a very challenging environment, and that's because of the vision of Chancellor Kerwin. He's been a wonderful leader and a partner of ours in OLI. Thank you very much for being here, Britt. <laughs> Jared, thank you so much. I uh, very much appreciate uh, the opportunity to be part of this uh, program. And, and Martha, I want to thank you for all you're doing to advance the cause of higher education um, there in the department and working with our president. Uh, and Jared mentioned the conversation we had uh, with, with the president, and Jared and I were both talking about uh, OLI, course redesign, the use of technology, learning science, et cetera. And um, uh, you could tell the president was, you know, quite excited about this. And uh, so there I am several weeks later listening to the uh, State of the Union address. And he talked about this uh, race to the top for higher education, which we mentioned at the, at, at the meeting. And then he said, and we've got to get into course redesign. And now that probably passed over the head of most Americans. <laughs> but Jared and I and all who were in that room know where that came from. And uh, I thought it was really um, quite, a, quite a sense, uh, an example of uh, you know, how how taken he is with, uh, with these new ideas that can help uh, promote teaching and learning. Well, um, Jared uh, and, and uh, Candace and her, uh, their colleagues at Carnegie Mellon have, of course, developed this phenomenal um, uh, strategy within the uh, very selective uh, and outstanding private university. And the question is, can these ideas be used in, in, in the public sector? So, um, I just wanted to give you a sense of what uh, the University System of Maryland, we've got 11 degree-granting institutions, uh, uh, two regional higher education centers, we've got 145,000 students, we've got selective public universities, open admissions uh, public universities, uh, and so it's a large, uh, complex public uh, university system. And, and you know, I hardly need to tell this audience that um, public universities uh, around the country are, are facing unprecedented uh, challenges, reductions in funding like we've never seen before in, in, in um, American higher education. In many states, 50% of the uh, public funding, state funding, has gone away. And uh, this has led to, um, uh, quite frankly, unsustainable uh, increases in, in, in tuition. I mean, we have, a, we, have a, we have a model at the moment that uh, is not serving our nation well, and um, ha we have to find other ways of doing things. And I, I think, Jared, your comments were so on the mark that you know, every other sector of society has figured out how to use technology to become more efficient, more effective. And we in higher education, who have created the ideas that have led to a lot of that technology, have not done that to the extent um, uh, that, that, that uh, the other sectors have. Um, and that's why I'm so excited about the work uh, that's going on at Carnegie Mellon 
And the work we're doing at the uh, University uh, System of Maryland, because of these resource uh, challenges and these demands for uh, greater college completion and faster time to degree, we have made a huge investment in uh, this course redesign, um, uh, new learning, uh, teaching and learning strategies. We embarked upon this working uh, with the National Center for Academic Transformation in Carroll Twigg. And um, then we've been now joined in a partnership uh, with Carnegie Mellon uh, through o OLI. And you know, I'm, I'm proud to say that um, uh, we now have, across the system, this spring, 12,000 students enrolled in redesigned, uh, open learning-like uh, classroom, classroom se settings. The thing that has impressed me so much about OLI uh, is that um, what, what has happened here is that they have brought the cognitive scientists together with the disciplinary experts. And that combination uh, of having, of course, you need the disciplinary experts, but the cognitive scientists to help design the software that will enable and optimize uh, learning and retention uh, in the students. That is the brilliance of, to me, of what's um, uh, going on uh, at, at OLI. So we have faculty on our campus that are using some of the OLI uh, uh, modules in their courses. We're engaged in a, a major research project with several other university systems using the statistics module that you uh, talked about to see the applicability in, a, in, in a big pu public uh, set settings. And we have a project underway with our online university, University of Maryland University College, where we are trying to, ad uh, uh, with the good help of Candace and her colleagues, trying to ad uh, adopt, adapt the OLI to a purely on online uh, uh, setting. So um, what I, uh, I've just become a, a, a huge uh, champion an advocate for the work that uh, OLI and others are doing uh, in, in, in this area for a number of reasons. I think th there's mounting evidence now that uh, these strategies, uh, after an initial investment, can uh, lower the cost of delivery of education and improve the learning not just in a given course, but in follow-on courses that use those uh, uh, basic, uh, basic um, uh, 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 introductory level courses. Um, it, it is uh, particularly effective uh, in uh, STEM courses, where we, of course, as a nation, have a huge need to increase our productivity with uh, STEM. Uh, it, it promotes a, a culture on the campuses of uh, educational innovation. Um, and uh, so w what we've learned from this is, uh, this experience is that, that uh, working with uh, OLI and with other universities, that, you know, we don't, this innovation that we're bringing into our teaching and le learning doesn't have to be in invented course by course and university by university. Working together in collaboration a as we are, we can accelerate the process of bringing these strategies uh, uh, into, uh, in, into our classrooms and to, uh, to our universities. Um, I'm a believer that uh, it is important to focus uh, initially on the low-hanging fruit, I, I would call it, uh, the large, lower division STEM courses. I think they are particularly well-designed for these strategies. And they are the important courses to focus on because we lose so many students uh, uh, out of the STEM pipeline in the first two years of college. Uh, I saw some statistics the other day that only a third of the students coming to our universities intending to measure major in STEM ever get, end up with a STEM degree. Um, so uh, in this part because they get turned off in those first two years. That's the magic of this uh, of this approach as we saw from those students in the uh, community uh, college. I think the uh, and I just want to make that point that the that um, that the another value of this approach is it is right for the students coming to our universities today. Um, 
Jared and I grew up in a period where we were very dutiful and we could go in a large lecture hall and sit and listen and take notes and, you know, very passive under a, a setting. But that's not this generation of students. They, they are, um, you know, uh, connect, they, they have all this uh, internet connection, social networking, uh, all, all of these gadgets and devices. And so multitasking, being interconnected with one another, working in teams, that's what works with this uh, generation of students. If, if you haven't read yet a book called The Shallows by Nicholas Carr, I urge you to read it because he really captures what's going on with this generation of students, the millennials if I can call them that, and why these strategies are so important and, and so effective uh, for this generation of, of students. So um, let me just uh, uh, conclude my uh, uh, comments by uh, mentioning a few factors that I think are very important as universities begin to roll out and think about uh, embracing uh, the, these strategies. I think it's very important for us to have, for universities, it certainly worked for us in the system, to have the availability of startup funds to invest uh, money to give to help faculty get started down this path. You've got to have some seed money to invest to uh, uh, engage the, the, the faculty. I think it's also important, as OLI is the prime example and uh, icon for doing, data gathering. We need data to show what's working and what isn't working so we can uh, ha have continuous uh, improvement with these uh, 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 strategies. I think it's also uh, important to understand that uh, w w with the faculty that this has to be um, faculty driven, but administratively nurtured and encouraged. So there's kind of a push-pull here. You just can't go to the faculty and say, here's what you're going to do, that isn't gonna work. But you have to create some incentives and motivation uh, for getting faculty in, in, engaged. But what we have found is if you do that, you develop these champions, these faculty champions for this that then can begin to infuse their in enthusiasm across the, uh, the institution and, and gain more and more uh, converts. I just believe at the end of the day, faculty um, uh, care deeply about uh, the learning their students uh, attain in their, in their classes. And when you can demonstrate to them that these strategies improve learning, then you can bring them along, their hearts and minds will follow because they will feel the sense of responsibility to, um, uh, to, to uh, embrace these strategies because of their proven um, uh, benefit. Now, you know, I, I recognize in these difficult times that there is uh, no silver bullet, uh, that uh, no one thing is going to solve our education problems, uh, higher education problems with uh, attainment and cost, et cetera. But I'm telling you, this is a huge step forward. Uh, the, the, the work coming out of OLI, this, 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 uh, these new learning strategies, um, is, is a huge step for, forward, and we've got to find a way uh, across the country in higher education to uh, embrace this thinking, and we are just so very, very proud to be a partner of, uh, with OLI, and I want to thank Jared for his leadership in moving the institution in this direction, and Candace for her brilliance in uh, bringing uh, OLI to the fore and helping others uh, learn from your great experience. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Britt. And now finally, you're gonna to get to hear from the brains behind the, uh, the operation. Uh, Ken Kettinger is Professor of Human-Computer Interaction in the Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science and co-director of the Pittsburgh Science and Learning Center. And Candace Till is director of the OLI Project. Colleagues, who's going first? You are, Candace. So, hello. So we're gonna be talking about what we're calling now the science and engineering of learning. So you've heard a bunch of people refer to Carnegie Mellon, so you might wanna say, what is this thing everyone's talking about? So in a nutshell, 
Carnegie Mellon's open learning initiative is scientifically based, open, really important, open online learning environments designed to improve both quality and productivity in higher education. Now when we say scientifically based, I mean Britt's right that the science courses are a key area, but that doesn't mean, that's not the science I'm talking about. The science I'm talking about is the science of learning. So I'm just going to do a couple little quick screenshots to show you what I mean, because one of the things we know from the science of learning is that goal-directed practice and targeted feedback support uh, accelerate learning. So when we're designing OLI activities, we take those kinds of ideas and incorporate them into the learning design. So this is out of our engineering statics course, where we simply give the students a problem, uh, asking them to sum these three forces. And they're simply asked to type in what's the direction and the magnitude of the sum. So they can go ahead and just type that in. They get, this is the immediate feedback that the students were talking about on the video. And they didn't know what to do, so they can ask for a hint. And the system will say, if you need some help, click here and we'll help, help, you rem help remind you of what the first step is. So they click there and resolve each of the forces into its components. And again, the student can ask for a hint if they're not sure how to do that. And the system walks them through a hinting sequence that is scaffolding the way we want them to be thinking when they're trying to solve the problem until they get what we call the bottom out hint, which is the answer. And we give them that so they don't get stuck, so they can keep practicing and move on. So I've sort of fast forwarded here till the student has finished this entire little mini tutor, and at the end it's a great that you were able to do this, but actually we would hope that you could do this without all that scaffolding and support. So click here and the system will generate another problem. When they click there, the graphical representations change, the problem changes, all the hints and feedback change. This gives the student virtually 24-7 support to, in learning this process. Um, also, and aside from just doing tutoring, there are lots of different kinds of learning activities. For example, when we're teaching chemistry, we teach it in the context of a real-world problem, which is the arsenic contamination of the water supply in Bangladesh. So the students aren't just taught, here's stoichiometry, learn it. They're put into the role of chemist to solve a real-world problem. And they're given a well water sample from a well in Bangladesh and asked, is this water safe to drink? This connects the chemistry to the real world. And they're given the World Health Organization statement about what safe drinking water is. And they can look at the analysis in the virtual lab and they can see how many moles of arsenic are in that water. But the World Health Organization tells them how many micrograms of arsenic are safe to drink. So in order to even answer that first question, they have to be able to do the conversion from uh, moles to micrograms per liter. And so what's, what you can't see this happening is as the students are interacting with the environment, not only is the student getting immediate feedback, but the system is collecting interaction level data about what the student is doing. And we're using that data to drive inferences about what the student is learning. So the other person who really needs that data, just as Britt was describing, is the instructor. So rather than saying to your students, Oh, I want to just say that one of the reasons these continuous embedded assessments are really important is because right now what we do to try and figure out what students know is we give them these high stakes, single chance opportunities to test. And it has some real consequences. This is out of yesterday's New York Times where it was talking about all these placements exams we give students and then place them into remedial education. And I'm, Martha can tell us the statistics of if you get placed three semesters back in remedial developmental math, your chances of ever getting out are, what, 7%? So, um, and then this new study that was done at the uh, Columbia University's teaching college uh, has shown us that actually these placement exams aren't very effective, are misplacing students, and so really actually harming students actually being able to attain. And what Ken will talk about is how we can use these environments to do much better continuous embedded assessments that'll better give us a much better picture of what the student's knowledge state is and how to, how to support them. So rather than doing these high stakes assessments to try and figure out what the student knows and what we should do with them, what the instructor can do instead is instead of saying, take this high stakes assessment or work in this paper and pencil environment, they can say, work through module three of the OLI course and, the and finish that before 10 o'clock Sunday night if we're gonna meet Monday morning. So the student works through the environment, they're getting all the support, hints and feedback, so their time's more productive and the system is collecting the data for the instructor, who then Sunday night can look at the instructor dashboard. 
Now this is a dashboard that's taken out, I took these screenshots out of an actual statistics course that's running at a community college right now. So this is real live data. This is a picture of this particular faculty member's class in their first module. Now the bars tell the instructor where the students are on those learning outcomes that they value. The students in the green tells them those students are doing well. If we were gonna give the student a test today, we would predict that that student would nail that test on that learning outcome. The students in the orange, they're doing okay, but they're still struggling a bit. The students in red, they're working, but they don't get it. The students in gray, well, those are the students that haven't done enough work in our system for us to make a reliable prediction. The instructor can also go, because that larger outcome, relate uh, measures of center and spread to the shape of a distribution and choose the appropriate measure in context, that larger outcome actually has a bunch of sub-knowledge sub and sub-components. So the instructor can also click over to this side and say, what are the component knowledge that the students need that they're struggling with that is not allowing them to support them to achieve that outcome? And so the instructor can click in and see who are those students that are those dots. I've put a block over it because as I said, this is a real class. And they can also look at, for certain sub-skills, like computing the median, what kinds of activities are the students doing in the course that are str they're struggling with? And this is just a sample activity. Now you'll notice that the activities in the course are not, here's a bunch of numbers, compute the median. We don't give you that activity 20 times. We give the students activities embedded in multiple different tasks and concepts. And so multiple times over the course, in doing many different things, they'll have to compute the median. And we're looking at how well they can compute the median in each one of those contexts. And so what are the affordances of the technology, of online technology? When you ask, most people will say one of these three things. The first thing they'll say is right there in the middle, convenience. That students can take learning anytime, any place. The other thing some people might say, is what's represented over here, which is you can show them things and do things that you can't do in the concrete world. You can show them molecular simulations or you can have them build a bridge and have a crush without killing a bunch of people. Or the connectivity piece, which is what Britt was talking about. With the online environments, we can have students connecting with students, students connecting with ep experts, students connecting with material. And all of these three things are great. The uh, but, they're not the most powerful thing about these environments. The most powerful thing about these environments are what Google has figured out. It's what Netflix has figured out. It's what Amazon has figured out. The most powerful thing about these environments is not just pushing information out, but using them as big data collectors to bring the information in. And what Google and Amazon and Netflix are using it for is to understand you better as a consumer or to understand consumers better. What we want to use that information for is to understand you better as a learner, so we can serve you better as a learner, and also understand better about learners in general. Now, Ken, I'm going to turn over to Ken, because he's going to talk about how we use this data to understand better about learners in general. I, I, I want to step back a second and uh, address a question that ex actually Chancellor Kerwin brought up, which I'm sure you've all thought of this question before. Why has science and technology made such incredible advances in, in things like medicine and transportation, but done so little for, uh, for education? And I want to suggest uh, that one of the root causes is that our as human beings, we learn and we experience learning, but what we experience is just a thin sliver of what's actually happening in our minds. What we know about our own learning is this tip of the iceberg here. And what's really going on when we learn is much bigger and it's much more complex. And because we have this impression that we understand learning, we are, our decisions that we make as educators and policies are biased by just a teeny bit of what's really going on. Well, the opportunity for science and technology is to understand what's going on underneath the surface there and make decisions that are much more informed by a deep understanding of what's going on. So we have to get past this notion that we know what we know. We have to accept that we don't know what we know and we, we don't really know what, what, uh, 
what it is we're learning, because a lot of it happens implicitly. So I want to make that a little bit more concrete by taking an example some, from some early work that I did uh, as we were building this algebra intelligent tutoring system that's now in use across the country, uh, and it, it was one of our early success cases. And it involves uh, an investigation into what, what's hard for beginning algebra students about algebra, what kind of problems do they have difficulty with, and, and you see uh, examples of three different kinds of problems here. And now, when I did this study, I was curious why those story problems have such a reputation of being so difficult. And in fact, when we ask math educators and teachers what do they think are the hardest problems, they say either the story or words, word problems are going to be the hardest. We ran a number of studies where we looked at the actual performance of students, and I was quite shocked. We and replicated this many times to find that, in fact, uh, that was wrong. That, in fact, the students were having most difficulty with the equations. These beginning algebra students, in essence, were struggling with algebra as a second language. And any of you who have tried to acquire a second language, you know how long it takes. Lots of repetition. And what's a little bit striking about this is that even though these algebra teachers, who, by the way, were the worst at making the correct pred prediction, the ones who actually teach this, they've learned it. They somehow haven't tracked all that work their brain was doing underneath the surface to acquire the language of algebra. And we think this is going on all over the place. And that's why it's so important that we have data to guide what we're doing. So uh, President Cohen mentioned our uh, Pittsburgh Science of Learning Center, which we call uh, Learn Lab for short. And we're, we're trying to, in that center, take advantage of these fielded technology systems like this algebra intelligent tutoring system, uh, the OLI courses, all of which are being used across the country and in some cases across the world, to do what we call basic research at scale. So there's, a, there's tons of learning science research out in the literature in schools of, of education and psychology. Uh, a lot of that gets done in the laboratory. What we want to do is use this opportunity of the technology to be able to do laboratory quality studies out in the real world, and we've been enabling that uh, through the center since 2004. One of the things that we're doing is uh, collecting a lot of data. I guess I'm the guy who's sh is showing you all the uh, professor geeky kind of graphs here, but uh, um, I want to uh, use this to once again illustrate the complexity of the learning process. Now, uh, DataShop is, is an open and free data repository. I believe it's the largest open data repository of educational uh, technology in the world. Um, and, and researchers can go and study this data. But I want to zoom in on one of these learning curves. Now, this is a learning curve of, a st of students working in a geometry uh, unit about the area of geometric figures. And the y-axis here is their error rate averaged across all the participating students as they get opportunities to practice. Uh, and if you look at that graph, does that look like a learning curve? Is there learning going on? It doesn't look like there's learning going on. If we look at learning at the level of, of like our standards at the K-12, this is what we would see. The complexity is not reflected at that level. If we take exactly the same data and graph it in terms of the specific skills that are being involved and count the opportunities to practice those, we now get a smooth learning curve as represented in the red line. And we can fit uh, statistical models to that uh, that make accurate predictions of student learners, and that's represented in the blue line. So we can see learning at this skill component level, and we can use the technology to help us understand it more de in a more detailed way. Now, many researchers have been doing this sort of thing. Uh, it's often called cognitive task analysis. Uh, Richard Clark at uh, the University of Southern Cal California has done a number of studies demonstrating that this kind of detailed analysis can dramatically improve courses. And for example, we've applied this in, in OLI, uh, one of the tough topics in the chemistry course is on equilibrium. And students uh, were about 20% correct on items in that course initially. And applying these techniques to that area involved uh, 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 a lot of analysis and some redesign of the course that then resulted in a large increment in improvement on uh, in student performance in that area. Now, the, the, what the future holds is a new opportunity for us to do that kind of intensive analysis, which is, which is often involves a lot, a, a lot of human effort, to accelerate and enhance it through the educational technology data. And we're starting to leverage that data shop 
crowdsourcing uh, techniques, machine learning techniques to essentially have humans and machines look at the individual learning curves for alleged uh, skill components and identify ones that may not actually be showing learning, that are indicators that we can make an improvement there, that we've got something wrong about the nature of stu student learning, and we can go zero in on that and improve the course. Uh, Candace mentioned that uh, one of the great opportunities here is because these technologies are collecting data constantly, you know, a teacher's not in a situation where, she, where he or she needs to wait until the spring or maybe even next year before the state test results come out to have good information about where students stand. We can get that information, and we've demonstrated that it's very accurate. Uh, this is data from uh, a system that was used, used in Massachusetts predicting the end of uh, year eighth grade math uh, MCAS uh, test score very accurately. So um, I don't know that we're at the stage where we can say we'll throw out that standardized test, but in some sense we're getting the information we need from the online technology, and we're getting it now when teachers can react to it. So the other thing I wanted to emphasize is it's not just complexity of learning, but complexity of instruction that's important. And often in our debates about education, we talk as though there are two alternatives for teaching. There's some back to the basics kind of approach and versus some reform report approach like uh, phonetics in, in, in reading versus whole uh, language, uh, whole word reading, or math has basic skills versus uh, more constructivist, more uh, deep thinking. This really does not well characterize with a complexity of instruction. There's much more than these two options, and there's, there's tons of uh, you know, volumes of work that's been done. Here are just three reports uh, that get at many, many different issues. There are things like, should we mass practice or distribute it over time? Or maybe uh, adaptively change the, the, t the distance between practice opportunities as technologies can do. But there's many more dimensions, uh, studying examples versus test on problems versus some mix. And these dimensions combine with each other. And this keeps going and going, and in fact, there are thousands of options for instructional choice. And herein is a huge opportunity for the science of learning to understand what works best, and as Martha Cantor was saying earlier, what works best for which students in which courses at which time. Uh, the problem is huge, the challenge is huge, but the opportunity is great, and, and I think we're uh, on our way to tackle that opportunity. One of the things Learn Lab's been doing is facilitating these laboratory quality studies within real classes, and uh, done many of those studies. Uh, one interesting one in STEM courses, uh, we found that it's often better uh, to have students provide explanations for worked out solutions of problems rather than the teachers provide those explanations. The students learn more from attempting to generate explanations than from receiving them. But once again, it's not a one-size-fits-all. We've also shown in other contexts that this strategy is actually rather inefficient in, in certain language learning contexts, for instance. Uh, so to, to summarize, we have a contrast here between uh, the, the way we often have thought about uh, design of courses in the past, which is more intuitive. It's usually isolated. A, a, a single professor is creating a new course. Um, and then we're basically flying blind as we deliver it and often have a kind of one-size-fits-all over simplification in, the, in, in that course. And the opportunity with, with OLI uh, and these new approaches is to have a more evidence-based approach, to have a connected development team working together, uh, as Chancellor Kerwin said, have cognitive scientists working with the course developers together, to have that be data-driven in the many different loops we've talked about, and to really manage this uh, complexity that I've tried to illustrate here. And it really does make a difference. Uh, we can use science and technology to improve assessment, make it more continuous, timely, and accurate, increase outcomes, accelerate learning, as in the statistics uh, uh, example you've heard about, and produce these uh, virtuous uh, cycles of, of improvement. So let me close with a quote from uh, Herbert Simon, who's a Nobel laureate uh, from Carnegie Mellon, who said, improvement in post-secondary education will require converting teaching from a solo sport to a community-based research activity. Thank you. <laughs>